All right, today we're going to touch on something we've hit little bits on already in the series, but it's an important topic because you can't have a farm business without the business part of it. In a farming context, the business is selling your crops that you grow. When you first conceptualized starting your own farm, did you have in mind a particular business model you wanted to go after when you were farming on your own, be it CSA, farmer's market? Was there just a, a preference there based on past experience or just listening to podcasts like this, other things? I definitely went in wanting to go the farmer's market route um, for two reasons. One, uh, I I like the idea of not having to go and like hunt down a customer base. Um, you know, if you pick a good market, you can kind of, um, you can, you still need to market and, you know, encourage people to come by, but you're, you're kind of going with like a baked in customer base if it's a good established market. Um, you know, and two, it's, um, I feel like it's a good way to, to just like move a lot of product at one time. You know, you can kind of plan like, all right, I got to have all my harvest and, you know, post harvest set up for a Saturday. And so we can work toward that one big day out of the week, get some good cash flow going. And, um, you know, and then when you sell out, you sell out. So if you only brought 30 bunches of carrots and it's like, you're, you don't have CSA customers. It's like, oh, maybe you have 35 CSA customers. You're like, well, crap, you know, I'm five bunches of carrots short. What do you do there? So definitely wanted to lean into the farmer's market, at least for the first little while, first couple of years. Yeah, I think at the beginning, it definitely simplifies a lot for somebody new. Just like you said, there's really, you don't have to hit inventory targets. Whatever you sell or whatever you grow, you try and sell it all. And you don't have to worry, like you said, about splitting it up between customers. And it, it makes probably processing a little bit easier, crop planning a lot easier. You're not having to um, make sure certain things are ready at certain times to fill out boxes, to round out boxes. It's just, hey, whatever's ready this week is what goes. And you can improve on that over time. When you look at, you know, a, a farmer's market has that built-in customer base, like you said. And I think there's different types of people. There's some people that are into door knocking, cold calling, and they don't mind going into restaurants, talking on chefs, going into stores, talking to people. I don't know that I'm that person who would want to do that. I'm not introverted, but I don't know that I'd want to go door to door trying to sell my stuff. What what type of person are you when it comes to sales? Because I think that definitely has to match up with the model that you're doing. Yeah. So I, I have a background in it, you know, doing like sales and marketing and different companies and capacities over, you know, the last decade or so. But um I wouldn't I wouldn't say I'm like the natural born salesman that yeah, it can it's like just give me the product and let me go sell it and I'll say whatever I need to say to get it sold and knock on as many doors as I can and make as many cold calls. Um but definitely like more extroverted and with something that I care about, you know, I can, I can sell the hell out of it. You know, I'll, because I believe in it and you can exude that. Um, but yeah, you know, especially right now where most of your time needs to be spent on farm, like every time that you're going to, you know, drop stuff off like a, you know, a box of something it's like, Hey, let this chef try this or whatever, whatever. I mean, you're just, you know, it's kind of like taking trips off the farm that are not generating any income. And so trying to limit those as much as possible right now. It's a really good point because your labor is spread thin. It's a one person operation. You can only do so much. If you know a farmer's market's coming in May, you have to apply, do a few things, but that's low lifting and then just be ready for May. If you're trying to build a disparate customer base of restaurants and stores and things like that, that's going to require a lot of stopping in, that type of thing. And if you're going to go visit them now, they're probably going to start wanting stuff now. It's not like you can go in and say, hey, you know, can I start selling to you in two months? Well, and and I, because you know, a lot of people have been like, hey, man, like I know this chef, you should go talk to him. I know this restaurant, you know, they would probably love to buy your stuff. And it's like, you know, like I, I'm, I would love to go talk to chefs you know, in what little time I had to do it. Um, but the truth of the matter is it's like, man, I don't want to, I don't want to set foot in a kitchen or a back office or, you know, a restaurant or whatever 
without being able to deliver. Like that's been a big hesitancy for me to do that is knowing like, man, I, cause it just, I'm already a new farmer. There's already probably going to be some like ebbs and flows in production and, and what, what I can offer when then to be like, make all these promises. I'm going to have this and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, and not be able to deliver right now. I just feel like as a, as a new business, especially with like a chef who's dealing with so many different things and on such thin margins and timelines, it's like the last thing they need is another person to come in and try to sell them a bill of goods that they may or not, may not be able to deliver on. Well, that's the worst for a new business, right? You go land a client, it goes great for the first couple of weeks, and then it just, something happens, hit, hits the fan, and then it fizzles out. You basically lost that person forever. Exactly. How confident would you be if you had a restaurant client that wanted whatever we'll call a normal restaurant order, so not obscene quantities, but they needed it on a weekly basis? Do you think with what you have set up on the farm, the actual infrastructure and stuff on the farm and your level of experience, could you consistently deliver on that right now? I, I Probably, you know, I, unfortunately, just because the farm that I've come from, you know, we don't really have any restaurant customers um, and, and I haven't really delved into that too much. So like, I honestly couldn't even tell you what like a, reasonable weekly order like so if i had a restaurant in town that wants to do like they wants to buy bok choy from me every single week like is 10 pounds realistic is it 30 pounds and so um i'm a i'm kind of flying blind there a little bit but i could probably deliver something consistently you know but it's also the thought of like or could i put a little, little more effort and try to push some local sales kind of just through my network of people who would buy retail as opposed to doing all that to then just kind of sell at a wholesale price just to move it. You know, it's like I'd, I'd almost rather put in the extra legwork and maybe have some more stuff on the farm that should be going out, but it's not yet to get those, those higher retail prices to get some cash flow going. How important is early cash flow? I mean, on one hand, it's you have stuff in the ground, like, so you want to sell it. You can accelerate how, how much you're growing in the ground in terms of crop wise to get more cash flow in time is limited. You could say, well, I'm not going to plant the crop because I want to finish other beds and get other things done on the farm. So you have a lot of dials, if you will, at your disposal here to play with and turn how, how critical is getting production up to, you know, tip top levels ASAP versus a, a little bit and, and continuing to build out what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, it's not obviously having some cash flow. Like even though I have some capital that I'm working with, you know, that that's kind of like the bare minimum that I need to be up or like to get up and running, you know, but there's always like ongoing expenses like fuel. Like if I'm driving to Atlanta to do, run a delivery or I'm doing whatever, like, fuel costs, you know, even though I haven't started paying rent and paying on the, um, you know, the business investment, it's like, I still have to pay insurance, still have to pay the utility bill, those sort of things. And so that just having that extra, you know, because inevitably there's going to be like, oh man, I can't believe I didn't even think about this tool or you know, like, man, I've already blown through my seed budget and I need to buy x y and z and i need to buy more because i need to make it worth my while if i'm going to make this purchase and so having that extra money coming in is is definitely critical um you know and it's given me a good sort of like dip my toe into kind of weekly sales weekly you know production harvest those sort of things and then just this week you had the mustard greens which you've talked about in a previous episode or Asian greens, and you sold those wholesale. What yeah. was that experience like? How did that come about? Yeah, so that was kind of like I'm, you know, I'm looking, and I, I, I think more than anything, I just poorly timed stuff. You know, got got a little overzealous on like getting stuff in the ground, um, just because it's like, because yeah, like I wanted to try to get some early sales under my belt before springtime comes, before the market starts in April. 
And so it's like, let's just get some stuff in the ground. And, um, you know, bok choy uh, or bok choy, mizuna, tatsoi, those sort of things. And just like didn't time it right. So stuff came ready to harvest much earlier than I had anticipated and was harvesting it and selling it retail the best I could and kind of reached this threshold of like, all right, if I just sit on this and keep selling it at this rate, it's going to go to flower and I'm not going to be able to sell it. You know, it's like, I, I can't sell. I mean, I, I guess that, you know, there's always a market for something out there, but um, for the most part, it's like, I need to be able to move a lot of this real quick. And then, so that's when I did switch into sort of like, all right, this is wholesale mode. Like, I'm not going to try to make retail prices. I'm not going to try to sell this individually to people. I just need to find a restaurant. I need to find a business. Um, actually reached out to a couple of, or one restaurant in particular, who was really eager to, to start working with me. Um, and, you know, they're like, yeah, sorry, we just don't need that right now. It's not fitting in what our seasonal menu is at the moment. Um, another reason to sing their praises, like, uh, it wholesale customers, a meal kit delivery service, um, it based out of Atlanta that's special. It's like HelloFresh, but like with like hyper local produce and just selling kind of just regionally. Um, and they're, and he was like, man, they're always looking for like Asian mustard greens. They're always looking for that sort of stuff. Um, it's like, let me ask, let me ask them if they're interested. And I'm like, I think I can do like 20. He comes back to me. He's like, they need 50. Can like, uh, let me, let me see, you know? And cause it's like, I'm also not to the point where I can like look at a whole bed and be like, yeah, a hundred pounds of X or you know, 30 pounds of that or this many bunches, it's still sort of trial and error. So it was literally a lot of like, all right, let's harvest. I know there's like 175 Mizuna plants, like Mizuna green plants. So let's harvest one and let's weigh what one harvested is and then extrapolate out from there. Um, you know, and I was able to almost reach their amount that they want. You know, they had like a threshold, but on the high end, they wanted like 50 pounds and I was able to deliver 45 pounds. Um, and so, yeah, like I didn't even have enough containers because they wanted like a mix and they wanted it loose because they're going to package it to their customers. Like I had to go and scramble and go um, to the hardware store and buy like Rubbermaid containers to load everything in. Um, probably not the ones I would have opted for, but in a pinch with the finances I had, it was like, let's just get these, let's get them filled. Um, you know, it, we definitely ran into that wash pack bottleneck that I was afraid of. Um, you know, but I, I took it, you know, had to go buy a printer so I could print out an invoice, um, all these little things that you kind of overlook and then, um, but delivered it and they were super happy and got my first like wholesale check. That was cool to deposit in the bank. And, um, you know, and hopefully in the future when I'm delivering a little bit more and maybe doing more stuff in Atlanta to make it worth the trip, I'll, uh, I'll be able to work with them in the future. Yeah, it reminds me of some story. I don't even know if this is true or not of Bill Gates early on when he started building computers and some company ordered like, oh, can you give us X computers, 50 computers? And he's like, yes, yes, we can. And he went yeah. back and they're like, oh, okay, we need to deliver 50 computers. And they're like, yeah, we have none. Um, so they had to build them in a, in a scramble. So how, so there's a full bed, right? You harvested or more than one bed? It was, um, it was kind of, I mean, they're all planted in different spots, but yeah, it was like, um, like a half bed of like Mizuna, half bed of bok choy and a half bed of Tatsui. So I think for somebody like who, who's grown for a while here in this, they're like big deal. Like this is nothing, but you're, you're coming from ground zero, right? So this is all, you're putting the pieces together as you go. And I think this is kind of the chaos of, of a startup of a business. Like you'd ideally in a perfect world say, yeah, like the wash pack's a hundred percent done. And you know, our, our pack line is a hundred percent done. Our refrigeration is a hundred percent done. It's all lined up and okay. Now we'll turn on the sales switch. Yeah. But in reality, it doesn't always line up like that. A big order comes across. You either say no, or you say yes. And you make it work and you find out a way to make it work. Well, and, you know, and it was kind of, I was at the threshold because I, I went back and forth and like, should I do this? Am I jumping the gun? Do I just need to wait? You know, but then it was like, as I was looking at how things were progressing, you know, it's like every day it looked like more and more little like flowers were popping up in the middle. 
Um, and it was just like, man, if I don't sell this, it's either like put my neck out there and try to deliver or it's three weeks from now, I don't even have product that's sellable and it's a cash crop turned into a cover crop. And so I'm making zero money on that. What was the apprehension? Like, why might you have said no? Why are you considering passing? Um, just because I'm leaving money on the table, really, you know, I mean, uh, you know, without like consistent sales happening right now, like, you know, and, and maybe it's just, maybe it's just a, a mindset that needs to change in me that it's like, you know, money coming in is money coming in, but it's just like, you know, I looked at all that work that I did and all those containers and how much greens that was. And it's like, man, if I would have sold that retail, it would have been like double the price, you know? And so I think that was probably my only apprehension. And then also it's like, do I harvest everything? Do I literally like cut everything to the ground? And, you know, the mizun and the topsoil, you know, it'll come back. It's cut and come again. Um, but, you know, it's like, do I harvest everything? And then what happens to the few customers that I have in the coffee shop that's buying stuff that people love this stuff? And I go, sorry, you know, like I don't have anything for you. So I ended up leaving a little bit um, that, you know, so that I can still sort of balance that that side and meet those few customers that I have. Um, and then also be able to deliver as much as I possibly could to the, to that customer. Yeah. It's that what's better one big sale that you can guarantee at a low price or possibly future sales at a higher price that might take too long and not even leave you with sellable product, right? That's the thing you're balancing in your head. Yeah. Well, and also too, you know, like another reason why I wanted to, just go all in on like a market right out the gate is then you don't have to like do that sort of balancing act of like, all right, I've got a whole bed here. Do I, you know, and I have restaurants asking how much I can do, but I also have to think about market on Saturday. And it's like, like it's, I see that being extremely difficult, especially early on to be able to, to find that balance of no, like how much do I need to save for Saturday and how much can I get away, you know, get out the door right now. And so if I'm just focused on markets, you know, other than the occasional thing like this, then it's just like, all right, this is what I have. I can do 50 bunches of kale this week. And I don't have to think about if 35 of those bunches are going to a restaurant. And then I only, you know, it, it just makes things a lot simpler to just learn how to grow, learn how to do it right and, uh, and be successful that way. It goes to show the unquantifiable value of experience and knowledge of knowing oh, man. I can look at a bed and estimate how much I can harvest. Like just that value is huge. Exactly. I, I know, all right, this is a, how much I'm going to need each week at a market. Like, so you can plan, right? Otherwise you're just, yeah. you're, you're guessing, you're shooting in the dark, you're hoping, that, you know, you're, yeah. like you said, you're flying blind on a lot of this and it, and it only comes with time because you just don't know until you get enough internal data built up and see it okay this bed yielded this much this time of year every week at the market i'm selling this much so i get the struggle behind a lot of that you know i think i saw that earlier on with paper bot it's like well how much of this stuff do you buy you buy a ton of it and yeah. if your inventory turnover is slow like you're sitting on it and you have cash tied up and stuff sitting there and it's the same for a farmer you plant a whole bunch early on not knowing if you can sell it, like you have this inventory sitting in the field, not, might not necessarily cost you a bunch, but there's also a moral hit to that. If like you can't sell it, like you hate to just till it under or flail mow it or do whatever you do with it uh, at the end of the day. So there is a lot of unknown figuring doing this. After having done that to that company, what did you think about selling wholesale? Is that something you'd entertain in the future just in terms of, unloading 45 pounds in one shot. I mean, there's definitely pros and cons, you know, pro was like, I didn't have to bag everything just because this particular product, like this, this, what I call like my stir fry mix or like an Asian mustard greens mix, you know, would typically be like 10 ounce bag, you know, zip or twist tie into a container, into the cooler, sell it individually or sell it at market, you know? And so this, I was able to just, harvest it all. And I could even kind of go through and harvest it as a mix, you know, cause everything's kind of in close proximity, you know, throw it all in the greens bubbler, mix it in there, you know, let it, let it go, you know, spin it, dry it, and then pack it and it's done. 
And so in that way, it was nice. Um, and like I alluded to before, like that much product going through wash pack was definitely a challenge. Like it, it felt like I was going to just spend my entire day, um, just using that little dinky salad spinner I have, just trying to get everything dry um, so I could pack it up. So that, so it was nice to be able to just pick it, throw it in a container, and then drive it down there. Um, but, you know, at the same time, yeah, it was like looking at the amount of work that, that, that it was, you know, and just thinking like, man, like, man, I, I literally left half the money on the table, you know, like I could, that could have been a, 500 that could have been $500 worth of greens as opposed to you know 250 um here's a so, question why why do you view it like that versus that's 250 versus zero yeah i mean it's it's probably you're probably right on that that it's just um that yeah like it it could have been zero it could have been just cover crop you know just blow mow it and just let it be a really expensive mulch um, and so in that sense, like, yeah, I'm extremely grateful, but I, I just think right now, like, because I have been in such a retail mode because I've you know been almost a hundred percent focusing on retail that, um, you know, those are sort of the numbers that my brain has been working with. And so it's, it's taking a little bit of an adjustment to realize that it's like, all right, you know, yeah, but think about how long it would have taken you to sell, you know, 40 you know, 30 to 40 bags of, well, no, it would have been more than that. It would have been, you know, closer to like 60 bags of, of products. Like that would have taken you more time that, you know, you, you had to spend packing it all. Where are you going to put it all? How are you going to distribute it out to all your customers? Um, so yeah, I haven't really done the actual breakdown on like how much it would profit me for, you know, if I were to try to do it retail, like if I did it in market, um, so yeah, I think it's probably just being able to adapt my mindset and adapt my um, my thinking on that. Yeah, I think it's fair. It's, it's tough. I mean, there's a lot of new experiences that come along in this type of thing. If if that company came back and said, "Hey, we loved what you gave us," which they did, which was awesome, yeah, coolest was, feedback in the world. That's that's great. And they said, "Hey." we want to get 50 pounds of some sort of braising stir fry mix every week for the rest of the year. If you can't start delivering right away, cause we know you're starting fine. So be it. But whenever you can, we want to, we'll place a consistent order 50 pounds a week. Do you want to do it? What would you say? Hmm. I, I would love, you know, I, it, it's it's hard because there's so many variables right now. You know, don't know how the market is going to do. I think it's going to be awesome. You know, if the market's like just going gangbusters, I'd be like, man, I I really am leaving money on the table. Like I can I can get this out the door, fifty pounds a week, no problem. You know, whatever. Um, but if it's like kind of more of a moderate, and I realize like, man, I've got the space to do it, and I can and I can push this product, and it also creates a reason for me to drive all the way into Atlanta every week, you know? And then, so then it's like, all right, well, the gas has already been spent. You know, the money's already been made for a trip into Atlanta. Let's make it worth our while. Let's try to reach some other customers or, you know, try to push, you know, some other sales Avenue in Atlanta, whatever. Um, you know, I would probably, I would probably seriously consider it. If it was like a consistent 50 pounds. Yeah. You know, kind of somewhere in that, like, Three hundred, two, three hundred dollars a a a week, every week. You know that would that would basically replace what I've been trying to do with my like you know half a dozen or so like CSA order pickup people. So how many beds do you have right now? Like fully done that you can count on? Sixteen with like new ones coming. You know every week. So if you needed. Like on, on spicy greens, you're like at 30 DTM about, so you need like four beds or probably five beds, right? A hundred foot beds on rotation to get about 50 pounds a week out of that. So you'd have to tie up five out of your 16 beds. 
to do that, right? So that's the trade-off. Can I, or do I need those extra five beds for the market, right? Like that's, yeah. that's what you have to weigh out. Yeah, you know, and, but it's like, can I, can I take a, a, a portion of that? Like, can I basically just say I'm committing five beds to, to, yeah, like mustard greens or to like cut and come again, greens like, like loose greens like that? And say that like, all right, well, you know, maybe we don't push it as hard at market. And it's like, oh, let's just take a little section off the off the top end, you know, to be able to do a couple dozen bags at market. And then the rest of it just goes to to the, you know, to the business. Um, it's like, yeah, like that probably just not have to deal with the like the the headache of of all of the post harvest or as much post harvest and knowing that it's like a consistent you know, like a consistent check every single week, you know, it definitely, you know, it would be good. And the more that I do it, you know, maybe instead of saying like, oh man, well, we're spending X amount of time seating, I don't know, eight rows with the JP1. And it's like, well, if we upgrade and realize like it's worth the investment to go ahead and get a JP5 or, you know, a six row seat or whatever, then it's like, and we can cut our seating time in half and, and then try to, find better ways with harvesting to make it all better. Like I can definitely see how that can become like a really good profit generator. If you, if you get it dialed in. I'm always thinking about hedging. Is there any worry about hedging the farmer's market? Like it could be good. It could be bad. I mean, I don't want to spook you, but you don't know, right? It's a farmer's market. The the only the good thing is they can bring you business. The bad thing is it could be poorly run or whatever that customer base doesn't resonate with you. So do you do you feel any pressure to have to set up another market stream to be like if if my primary doesn't work, at least I have this going as a B? You know, I mean definitely I, I think, you know, I had so I have I have settled on a market. I'm doing this one in a town called Monroe, not too far from us. It's a really great market, um, from what I understand and from what I've seen the couple times I've been there. Um, you know, but the farm manager and like one of the other farmers who's there came out because like they want to be able to like prove that I'm actually growing. I'm not just retailing. And you know, and so I started asking a lot of questions like like, hey, if I'm if I'm trying to make a thousand bucks a week, is that realistic at this market? You know, what are you charging for tomatoes? What are you charging this and that, whatever, you know? And like, if my expectation and faith in this market was at a hundred when I started, it's probably at like an 85 now. So it definitely sort of like hampered a little bit of that expectation realizing it's like, hmm, like there might be a little bit of uphill battle with the prices that I'm charging. Why like, is that? Why you... I, I just, I think the... I don't know. I don't know if they have had a grower with like sort of the like the with the, from the business perspective that I'm bringing. I don't know if any if anybody that's going to be selling there is listening to this. I apologize, but um, just from the prices that I was hearing and the like the amount of sales from what this lady was saying and what some of the other people were getting, it is like what I thought would be like a shoe in like thousand bucks a market, easy, no problem. It's like oh, it might actually be challenging. You know, when she's like, well, I've never hit that amount, but, you know, but if you're also charging $2 a pound for tomatoes, like, yeah, it's going to be hard to hit that amount. But if you're charging $5 a pound for tomatoes, you know, literally it's going to be two times easier to hit those numbers. Yeah. It's like a lot of truck farmers, you know, or that just, or like, kind I mean, of like every, kind every of... it's a grower only farmer's market. So that is nice. But I think it's just, you know, people who have been there for a long time. And they just kind of charge their modest price for their modest product, you know. But that's the whole reason why they wanted me is because I'm doing like specialty greens. I'm doing salad mix, like bagged stuff, um, you know. And that was a, a an area that they saw that was missing that their customers were asking for. So I'm just hoping that I'm filling the need that they have and it will pay off. Yeah, I think there's a lot of businesses, this isn't farmer only, that just don't know their numbers. You know, I'll see this when I research products and Darby and I have talked about this on grass fed life in the past. And it's like, am I doing something wrong? Is this price wrong? Or is this person just not using Excel? And I think at the end of the day, 
they're not using Excel. Like they don't know what to charge and they're just kind of like, uh, three fifty a pound. Yeah. And their costs are three twenty five a pound and they just have no concept and they're not making any money, mm -hmm. which is bad in the sense that it deflates the market, you know, around here, if you go try and sell eggs on Craigslist, you'll find eggs for, you know, the people say free range and organic for four bucks a dozen or something. And it's like, okay. you, you're not, you just some backyarder, right? It's a total hobby. I get it. But you know, you, they're, those eggs are costing you that much. Exactly. And so it deflates the market, but it gives you the advantage because if you know your numbers, right? And you can charge what you need to. So you're operating the business more efficiently, but they're 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 tanking the market for you. So it's like they, they're ruining the curve for you. So yeah. it is that challenge to navigate. So say the market is, say you're hoping for a, a 10 and the market turns out to be a, a five. Like, do you have another market you'd plan on? Would you be okay just pivoting off of that and saying like, see ya? Would you look to add another market at another day during the week? How would you address that? Yeah, I would probably, I would probably look at another, there's another one, Athens, which isn't too far from us, has a, there's a Wednesday market, you know, and so I'm not having to like basically choose between, you know, two things and like, do I want this one and just ride it out and hope for the best and, and, you know, and do the, the heavy lifting now so that next year I sort of like held the hands of these customers and I've built new customers or whatever, whatever, or do I just like, you know, cut my losses and move on to something else, you know, cause there's tons of markets I could try to get into, you know, or, um, what I would probably most likely do is, yeah, either try to lean into the, the wholesale stuff because I do have connections or I'm like one degree of separation away from tons of stuff. Like I got a message the other day, a guy's like, Hey man, you know, been loving looks really awesome. Just let me know when you're ready. Cause I know a couple of chefs that would probably buy your stuff. And so it's like, I know I always have that on the back burner that I'm not having to basically start out from nothing to reach out to chefs and to restaurants. Um, but I would probably, I would probably ride it out. You know, like if, if we get into June and it's like, dude, this market's a five. It's like, let's get through the summer. Let's get through maybe beginning of fall or maybe let's think at this rate we can still break even um let's just ride it out and try to build it up and lean into more of our like sales and marketing skills and try to like even market the farm out of our own cost and expense maybe not but you know just with time and energy to try to build it up for ourselves um and oh yeah i would probably just ride it out and then maybe do a little bit more work in the off season and try to find something better knowing that i have a year under my belt of like this is what i can deliver this is what I was able to deliver and, you know, try to find something that can meet those two better. If you end up going there and you, you probably start to get some sort of trend early on, you know, it's going to take a few weeks. Let's say you sell there for six weeks and you find out, all right, every time I'm bringing 10 units of stuff and I'm selling seven units of stuff. So consistently I have three units of stuff left over. Would you would you feel comfortable at that point reaching out to some of those other contacts and chefs and being like, you know, I'm always having these three units of stuff left over. I might as well try and get some consistent sales going with that stuff. And if I sell it at the market, I sell it at the market. That's good, right? Like I've sold 100% of the stuff at the end of the day versus 70% or seven units if I just sold at the market. Yeah, I mean, I would I would much rather do that. Um Cause like I've seen some stuff where like people like toward the end of the day, will start marking stuff down um, just to like move the last little bit that they have. And, and to me, you know, I mean, it's just like, what's the difference if you mark, if you sell it for half off at the market, you know, as opposed to selling it at wholesale to a chef, um, like what's the difference? You make the same amount of money, but I don't know kind of the way I see it. It's like, yeah, but you're devaluing your retail product at the market. And then, and then you're kind of, training your customers to know like, Oh, well, you know, you know, whatever, whatever. So, but I would, I would definitely, 
um, I would definitely start reaching out, especially because there's several like really amazing restaurants in in that town. So like I would just like pack everything up, grab what I have, and march across the street to the restaurant and be like, hey, man, you know, and probably at first I'd be like, just take it, like just cook with it. Try it. Tell me what you think. And um, I can bring you more next week. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then, yeah, I'm going to start reaching out to to people um, like closer to the city and and try to and maybe pivot. And maybe it's like, well, maybe I'm consistently selling seven, but it's like, what if, if I only sell five and then I can give the restaurant five and I can build this up to where maybe, you know, on the off weeks from the from the market, I'm still consistently giving five to the farm or to the restaurant, you know. Maybe, yeah, someone's like kind of backing off of one to be able to better facilitate another one, even at a slightly lower profit margin, might be better in the long run of the sustainability of the business. Be interesting. All theoretical, of course. Yeah, and, and like it's it's how much lower is the margin too? So I, I get the retail, the, the unit price is lower selling to wholesale, but like you said, that's not you touching a couple bulk containers versus 60 bags. You don't have the 60 bag cost. You don't have the time okay. to put things in 60 bags, right? Yeah. To store the 60 bags, all that type of thing. Um, dealing with 60 customers, transactions, you know, all that stuff, there's stuff that can go wrong in there. So the retail price is higher, but the cost is also higher. What about, um? so, if you think ahead, this is this is this is good to have this conversation with you never having been at the market because we're just we're totally guessing and this is the position any new farmer would be in. If you go off what that lady says and you say, All right, well, the market might be like this, we'll see. You have a pricing plan of what you want to go in there and sell. Let's say you want to sell salad mix for 10 ounces for I don't know, eight dollars. What do you have a plan? What's what's one product you know where you're gonna price it? Do you have any? Yeah, so like so salad right now it'll be once market season starts because I'm gonna have to come up a little bit because I realized I was a little low. But it'll be like six fifty for a half pound bag of of lettuce mix. Okay, so you know? so thirteen dollars a pound. We'll see. Yeah. Okay, thirteen dollars a pound lettuce. The customers at that market could not resonate with it for a few reasons. One, they they might not they might be buying from somebody else at the market. They don't want to buy from you. They might not like you for whatever reason. They might not like, why. I know why, what would, what would that be? They might not like the product or they might not like the price. So if you look at the price, do you anticipate or how are you going to handle pricing? Are you looking at it like I'm going in with this price list and I am not changing prices regardless of what happens or are you looking at it like i don't mean during the day itself but on a week-to-week -week basis as you learn more about the market competitors the landscape the customer base you're getting feedback how do you anticipate handling pricing structure um just another sound like a broken record but like just another benefit of being able to be on another farm for two years. It's like, I know what a reasonable size bunch of hacker eye turnips feels like. Like I know how, you know, if they're this big, it's eight. If it's this big, it's five, you know, whatever, whatever. Like I know what that, and I know what it's consistently being sold for. And so it's like, all right, I can hit those numbers. And, and then you combine that with that, the fact that I am, I am selling some stuff right now just to sort of friends and family and like local people who are consistently buying it. And it's like, and nobody's batting an eye. They're coming back and buying it week after week. And so it's like, all right, these numbers are, you know, it's so like a bunch of, you know, like a bunch of five hacker eye turnips that are golf ball size for four bucks. Um, like that to me, that feels very reasonable, but also I, I think I'm making money on that, you know? And so it's like, I'm going into the market going like, here's my, here's my prices and I'm definitely not anticipating going down. Like I think I'm kind of at the, the, the threshold of where I need to be on the low end of like, like I can't, I can't really go any lower than this because I know what this is worth and I know what it can sell for. And I know what people are paying for it. Um, you know, and it's like, and if maybe these people just aren't quite, like ready for this or this just isn't really what they're looking for then like 
instead of trying to change the farm to meet the market, I would much rather change the market to meet the farm. If that makes sense. So, yeah, so if you'd anything, be, you'd be prepared if anything, I'm going to, I'm anticipating, like, like I said, I need to go up 50 cents a, a, a bag or, you know, or a dollar a pound on something to, to make it actually like profitable enough that I can continue to do this week after week. Yeah. On one hand, it's, if you're selling out really quick, then it's like, Oh, well, that's a good sign. I can ratchet prices up a little bit. Yeah. Right. If, if prices aren't a fit for your market, I like how you said that, you know, we're not going to change the farm to meet the market, the mark, we might have to change the market to meet the farm. So if, if that market just doesn't resonate with your prices, you're prepared to say, not the right market. We'll find a new one. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or try to, you know, try to take the initiative to find better people to shop at that market, you know? Cause it's like, I don't, I don't spend any time right now attracting people to that market. I've never been there before. You know, it's like nobody in Monroe is like, Oh my God, like Alec at crop culture farm is going to be here. Like, you know, I'm going to be there. Um, but once I'm there and I can establish myself, you know, then maybe do some targeted work with social media to try to like reach that demographic of people in that town and that surrounding geographical area and like try to sort of sort of adapt the market to what you do. That sounds like a pretty daunting task, you know, but I think just through putting yourself out there, letting people actually try stuff, encourage them to buy it, and then they start to see how good it actually is and that this really is worth it, you know. I think you you could you could almost skew the market the farmer's market toward what you need not in a big way you know it's like a, a one degree change but like a you know a big ship takes a long time to turn like over time you might be able to actually turn um turn the market toward what you need to do which is kind of me being there is a step up is a step toward that you know they realized we're missing this one piece let's find someone who fills that niche and so it's like that market's already turning one degree so maybe we can turn it another degree and next year it'll be exactly where we need it to be. Yeah, I don't think it's a bad thing to be the highest priced vendor in your category in a market. And there's no. probably somebody at the market that's going to be, oh, ha, 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 we're haughty. We bought from Crop Culture Farm. Yeah. Oh, we can't afford that. Uh, pity yeah. on you. Yeah. So, I, you know, I see this a lot with tools. Where I realize after doing this for six, seven years that if you don't get pricing right, it all falls apart. You have to price your product for not just to make a profit now, but to keep you going in the long run. It It's not enough to say, I need to cover costs today, but I need to have some component of my price that is an investment into the future. And people, this is any industry. It's like, well, if you want tools in the future, well, I have to be in business to sell you those tools that you want in the future. And that means you're going to have to pay part of that cost every time you make a purchase. Same thing with the farm. If you want this quality of food in the future, well, we have to survive to be here to sell it to you. And, you know, we'll see, you know, people be like, oh, this is too much. Like we just, you charge too much for this. It's like, well, I'm charging what I have to sell for. Yeah. And, and some people don't get it because I always want to say like, look, you're, you're not competing against Walmart, right? Like you're you're trying to sell a premium vegetable product in your market. Um, you're not trying to sell the lowest price thing yet for some reason, like you want me to like match lowest price kind of Amazon China quality thing. Um, it's a weird dichotomy that that people have. So it 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 flows throughout the vertical stream of of suppliers in any system. If you think about reject rates, meaning some people are going to come up to your booth. They're going to scoff at the price. Some people are going to come up. They're not going to bat an eye. And there's a lot of theories around. You want some people coming up saying like, I don't know, too expensive, like really thinking about it and then pulling the trigger where if people are just handing you money too quick, like yeah, you haven't provided enough cost barrier 
Um, are you okay to deflect those those people being like, eh, you're too expensive? You know, I mean, it, it just depends. You know, it depends on the person. You know, if it's if it's person A that thinks everything's too expensive, then it's like, I'm never going to win them over, you know, until they try my stuff and they'll be like, oh man, this is totally worth it. Um, but, you know, and, and so I think it depends. Like, you know, if, if it's kind of like, and I don't know, you, you, you I'll kind of be able to see people that sort of, seem to fall within my demographic, you know, like they have a little bit of expendable income, you know, and they are conscious about their health or conscious about like eating local, um, you know, and it's, and if they're saying you're too expensive, then it's like, ah, maybe I need to, con maybe I need to think about that. Like if consistently those types of people are saying that, then it's like, maybe I am, you know, maybe I'm like skirting the upper threshold too much. Yeah. But I mean, if it's just the people that are like, we, you know, we stopped by the antique store down the road and we saw there was a farmer's market and we just kind of pop in and, you know, they're just sort of browsing and they're like kind of scoff at your stuff. It's like, you probably weren't going to buy anything anyways. And so, um, you know, I'm totally cool with just sort of like letting those people go, um, you know, but, but at the end of the day, I'm working really hard to know what my numbers are, you know? And so it's like, you know, haters be damned. Like if, if, if you think that my price is too high, but I know that I have to charge this price to be here next year, then, then like I have less, you know, it's going to be less motivation for me to be willing to bend to that. Like you just kind of have to be secure and know, like I know what I have and I know what I'm charging is fair. And I know that I have to charge this to, to make this a career. And so, you know, and it's like, like, and then back to the whole thing, like maybe this is not the market for my farm. If you look at just what you know about vegetables in the area, the the pricing you're anticipating charging that three thirteen dollars a pound salad mix, where do you think that lands? If you not just your market, if you took all the markets you know of, whatever Whole Foods stores like that, where do you think thirteen dollars lands from the cheapest to the most expensive? Are you right of middle? Are you at middle? I'm saying I'm I'm north of north of middle i'm not i'm not at the top end you know i'm not charging like 14 15 16 dollars a pound um which i think some people are you know like i think i saw one farm the other day that was char they were like five bucks for a quarter pound bag you know and uh so that's what like that's like 20 dollars a pound for salad mix and so um you know, and I mean, hey, maybe maybe we'll talk in October and it'll be like, dude, like we can charge five dollars for a quarter pound bag and people are eating it up. But, you know, so, yeah, I would say I'm probably, you know, if you put it on a scale of one being the cheapest and 100 being the most expensive, I'm probably like 65, 70, maybe. If I, I hate to do this because you don't have a crystal ball, but I'll do it. If you had to guess right now forget hope just based on what you know what you think how do you think this first year market works out in terms of pricing i'm i'm super confident because of like the little bit of like real market research i've done selling to people who are don't fall into my like ideal farmer's market customer and they're buying it and loving it and coming back week after week and texting me and telling me how much how much they love it um like I'm, I'm really not that concerned, um, because the area that I'm selling into does meet that demographic of, you know, like kind of income sort of thing. And so, you know, I, I think we'll be able to hit it. No problem. And like, and, and if anything, I think we'll probably be able to, to bump it up a little bit. You've mentioned a few times that the market wants you there, like your type of farm there. What's different about what you're doing than some of the vendors that they have in the produce space? Greens, 100%. Um, you know, uh, from what I've seen, you know, I mean, not that nobody's selling greens. You know, there's people that have some lettuce or, or you know, they're selling beets with the tops on or carrots and, you know, those sort of things. But I think I think having the, like, the, the bok choys, the, you know, the, the mustard greens, the just the really nice bunches of kale and then the, the mixes, 
you know, the salad mix, the braising mix, you know, different things like that, the baby greens. I think that's really, um, that's really what is setting me apart from the other people. Cause you know, everyone else is going to have tomatoes. Everyone else, a lot of people are probably gonna have peppers. Don't know if it'll be the same varieties or what, but, um, everyone will have okra. I can guarantee it. Some people probably have sweet potatoes, um, you know, some root stuff, but man, it's like, I didn't want to be a greens farm just because it's like, God, that just seems like the, you know, I, I didn't want to be the super dialed in by the numbers. Like, man, we just like run and gun and we sell three things and we sell it for a thousand dollars a pound and, you know, just get it out the door, you know, but I'm realizing it's like, man, there's a reason why that's popular kind of in this space is because like, dude, it makes money and people really want it. Yeah. That, that's the interesting thing about being an outlier where you're providing something that other people aren't, it can either be a huge win or it can, or there can be a reason, you know, around me, if you opened a Chinese restaurant, I don't think you'd last very long. If you opened a Mexican restaurant, you'd probably be in business for a long time. And there's a hundred Mexican restaurants in Vista yeah. where I live. I mean, you, you, it's just what people want and that's the culture here. So you're competing against other people, but that's what people want. And the outlier is like, we don't want you. Just serve burritos. So this is the good thing you got going for you. It's either people will love the mix because you're the only one or they're the market that doesn't want the mix. But it sounds like they want the mix. Yeah, well, and you, know, and you just kind of look around because you know, look at the businesses that are operating seemingly successful. They haven't gone out of business. You know, they've survived COVID like literally in the downtown area where the market will be. And then like kind of the surrounding area. And it's like, dude, like across the street from where the farmer's market is, there is a restaurant that has their own butcher shop, like hand, like handcrafted mortadella in house buying grass fed pasture raised, you know, stuff like that. And it's like, all right. So if that can do well in this town, then surely like high end salad mix will do just fine. 